Hi, my name is John Janetta, and I'm President and CEO of Heartland Family Service. I'm currently in my 12th year in this role. I'm really excited and honored to be able to have this opportunity to share an overview of our agency with you. To that end, I will describe our history. I'll share information about who we serve and how they find our agency for help. I'll talk about our mission, our impact we hope to create, and how we are uniquely able to do so as a multi-service organization. I'll describe our program focus areas and some of the services we offer in each. I'll share information about our budget, how we're governed, and how we plan for the future. And I'll highlight some of the major challenges we are facing. Heartland Family Service was founded in 1875 as a collaborative effort between eight Protestant churches to minimize duplication and deliver services effectively. It was 10 years after the Civil War ended and our country was in the midst of a depression or panic as they called it back then. And since it would be nearly 100 years before our government became deeply involved in addressing poverty, it was up to faith communities by and large to do this work. At the same time, there was a prevailing belief that it was better to focus on work as the basis of relief rather than just cash assistance. So the Christian Workers Association, as we were first known, began its existence by providing programs that offered clients the opportunity to earn money for themselves and their families. Given there were so many different religious perspectives held by the founding churches, it didn't take long for everyone involved to realize the best path forward was to have each church retain the responsibilities associated with teaching their faith and allow the collaborative effort, our agency, to be non-sectarian. So before the first year of our existence came to a close, that decision was made, and the name of the organization was changed to Omaha City Mission. We've been non-sectarian ever since. Our first program was a wood yard where men could chop wood and then take what they chopped to sell. We provided the wood and the tools. They were able to keep all of the money they earned from the wood they sold. This program was followed by an industrial school where women and girls were taught sewing and proper work attitudes. Later, the Provident, Provident Laundry and Training School was opened to give work to widows and married women who had quote-unquote drunken and deserted husbands. A soup house was also formed. Of course, there were families where the money earned through these employment programs wasn't enough, or situations where the adults in the home could not work. So the agency also provided cash assistance. In fact, this work was done in collaboration with other agencies, churches, and synagogues. At one point, we had memoranda of understanding with 51 other organizations to jointly case manage the people being served in order to ensure some individuals and families weren't overserved while others weren't being served at all. This collaborative effort eventually became known as the Community Chest, which later evolved to become the United Way. In fact, we continue to receive funding from United Way to this day, and these dollars are exceptionally helpful as they typically fund our programs that don't have any ability to generate fees, or they help to fill the gap between what we are able to generate for programs that can generate fees and what it actually costs to deliver the services, and usually that's a fairly big gap. Along with the provision of these programs and financial help, we also had a very active volunteer program modeled after an international friendly visitor program that was created by charity organization societies formed in England in 1869. Our friendly visitors were largely comprised of upper class women. They would visit the people we serve to bring good cheer, to identify the full range of issues needing to be addressed, to connect our clients to employment and other resources in the community, and when resources were not available to help create the programming needed. By the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s, some of these volunteer-friendly visitors became paid caseworkers or social workers. Around the same time frame, given our propensity to assess for gaps in resources and then create solutions, we developed just sort of naturally into a multi-service organization with a variety of program offerings. At the same time, we changed our name to Associated Charities in keeping with another larger international movement that started in Germany and was based upon the conviction that instead of providing direct relief, agencies like ours should address the cycle in, of poverty and end that cycle of poverty. It was a name we carried for nearly 40 years. It wasn't until 1930 that family was first observed in our name when we became the Family Welfare Association and Children's Bureau. During World War II, we became Family Service of Omaha, and in the 1970s, we merged with another Family Service Agency in Council Bluffs to become Family Service of Omaha Council Bluffs. Since that was such a long name, just a few years later, we shortened our name to simply Family Service, 
And finally, in 2004, reflecting the fact that we were operating in seven communities in East Central Nebraska and Southwestern Iowa and serving people throughout that geography, we changed our name to Heartland Family Service. Today, we serve between 60 and 65,000 people per year. And just like when we first started in 1875, most of the people we serve are very poor. In 2019, 83% of our clients made less than $25,000 per year and 62% made less than $10,000 per year. The people we serve somewhat mirror the demographics of the larger geographic area we serve with 72.4% identifying as Caucasian, 15.1% as Black or African American, 9% as Hispanic, Latino, or Latinx, 5.2% as Asian, 5% as two or more races, and 2% as American Indian Alaska Native. Our top three referral sources include mandated sources such as judges, probation officers, and child welfare workers, our current clients, and our former clients. It's important to recognize that most of the people coming to Heartland Family Service for help are not initially coming because they want to. They are coming because someone in a position of power told them they had to. But along the way, our staff are creating a trusting therapeutic relationship and helping our clients to achieve their goals. So much so, they're telling other people they know to come to Heartland Family Service for help. We operate from 19 locations in six communities, largely in the Omaha Council Bluffs metropolitan statistical area. As you can see, most of the locations are in Douglas, Sarpy, and Pottawatomie counties, but we also have small outpatient mental health and substance use treatment clinics in Glenwood, Iowa, and in Logan, Iowa. Not all of our locations are featured on this map. We have two concealed shelters, one for domestic abuse survivors and one for human trafficking survivors that are not um, obviously not shown on the map. To deliver our programming from all of these locations and directly in the community, we employ 410 full-time equivalent employees. The mission of our agency is to strengthen individuals and families through counseling, education, and support services. And we achieve this mission by increasing the safety, self-sufficiency, and well-being of the people that we serve. A few years ago, we were fortunate to receive considerable funding from local foundations, and these funds allowed us to develop and implement a longitudinal study of our intended impact that has now been incorporated into our ongoing evaluation processes. So we can finally see, are the changes that we're making that we're helping our clients to achieve actually creating positive impact, and are they being sustained? I'll share more about the results of that study when I discuss the impact our agency is making later in this presentation. 84% of our clients have one or more categories of adverse childhood experiences, and 51% have four or more. These categories of trauma that occurred between birth and the age of 18 include contact sexual abuse, emotional abuse, emotional neglect, physical abuse, physical neglect, having a household member with mental illness, having an incarcerated parent, witnessing your mother or mother figure treated violently, having a parent who abuses drugs or alcohol, and having only one or no parents. Given the fact so many of our clients have experienced trauma, first as children and then sadly again as adults, a major unifying aspect of our work is to address the underlying trauma that, as this slide demonstrates, con contributes so significantly to the health and social problems that bring people to our agency. It's especially critical because we know these traumas tend to be passed down from one generation to the next in what researchers call an unvirtuous cycle. First, a child experiences toxic childhood stress, which could be multiple categories of adverse childhood experiences or one particular category of trauma that is ever present or repeated frequently. That leads to chronic fight or flight response where the brain and body think there is constant danger that must be attended to. That leads to changes in the brain or body which then leads to an increased likelihood of using unsafe coping strategies that feel safe but include all sorts of short and long-term detrimental unintended health, emotional, and social problems. And this means the next generation will be exposed to toxic childhood stress and so on and so on. In animal studies completed over the last three years or so, 
researchers have discovered after this trauma has been passed down to four or five generations, some of these changes become permanently encoded in the DNA of the offspring, meaning future generations will have all of the neurobiological manifestations of trauma without necessarily having experienced it. As a result, it is imperative we address the underlying trauma of our clients and interrupt this unvirtuous and costly cycle. Within Heartland Family Service, we offer a full continuum of services that build from a place of safety. Understanding how the brain works, we know we must first help our clients to experience safety before they can create a, tr create a trusting relationship with their therapist, counselor, case manager, or teacher, access their long-term memory to process their trauma, and get to their thinking brain in order to plan goals, evaluate options, and even control impulses. So our continuum of services looks similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs if you've taken an intro to psychology course before. At the very bottom or foundation of the continuum, we have our safety and housing programs. Then we have our recovering programs, substance use treatment, gambling treatment, and mental health counseling. Next, we have our programming focused on creating increased financial stability, child well-being, and finally community well-being round out the continuum. While it's not uncommon for clients to initially be referred to Heartland Family Service for one thing, for example, substance use treatment, during the course of providing that service and the development of a trusting re therapeutic relationship, other needs will be uncovered and must be addressed if the changes our clients seek to create or to be sustained. Depending on the specific needs of each client, these services are provided sequentially or simultaneously and almost always include both programming programming offered within Heartland Family Service and programs offered within the community. Generally speaking, a complete wraparound plan is developed for each client we serve and updated with the client as they make progress towards their goals. If we address our client's underlying trauma while also securing their goals and the foundational levels of our continuum, safety, housing, and recovery, these goals will be sustained into the future, allowing our clients to grow their financial stability, which in turn will enhance the well-being of their children. And as our vision for the future describes, these healthy families will create a healthy community. As more and more individuals and families move to a place of sustained safety, self-sufficiency, self and well-being, fewer indi individuals and families will need help with safety, housing, and recovery. As a result, over the next 150 years, our work will become increasingly focused on prevention, helping to maintain child and community well-being so everyone can thrive. Within our continuum, we offer 45 programs organized into three focus areas, counseling and prevention, housing and financial stability, child, family, and community well-being. We will now explore these focus areas by touching on some of the programs we offer in each as examples. Counseling and prevention is our largest focus area by budget, numbers of programs offered, and by the number of people served. These programs deliver outpatient, community-based, and residential substance use treatment and mental health counseling as well as prevention education for gambling and the use of drugs, alcohol, and tobacco products. As much as possible, we deliver our counseling services using an integrated or co-occurring approach, meaning our therapists are trained and licensed to provide both mental health counseling and substance use treatment. Thus, our clients are able to see one therapist and have interventions that address all of their behavioral health needs at once. We provide treatment for problem gambling and substance use disorders. The majority of this work is done on an outpatient basis from five clinics we operate in Omaha Papillion, Council Bluffs, Logan, and Glenwood. In addition to this outpatient work, we also have two long-term residential substance use treatment programs for pregnant and or parenting women, Iowa Family Works and Nebraska Family Works. These programs are unique in that the pregnant women are the priority population served and women with children complete treatment with their children. For this reason, there are two therapists. One therapist works with the women on their mental health substance use, and the other therapist works with the women and their children on parenting and attachment. Of course, a complete complement of education and case management services are provided as well throughout the women's six to nine month stay in this program. This two generational approach is critical as we know that parents with six or more categories of adverse childhood experiences, which is the average for the women served in this program, they are 14 times more likely to pass these adverse childhood experiences on to their children. Outpatient mental health counseling is also a major program for our agency. 
Our five locations that offer outpatient gambling and substance use treatment also offer outpatient mental health counseling, which includes child, adult, and family therapy. In addition, we have a sixth outpatient clinic in Council Bluffs, our Child and Family Center, that offers child and family mental health counseling services only. The top three reasons people come to Heartland Family Service for outpatient mental health counseling include parent-child issues, depression, and anxiety. We have two schools, one in Omaha, which is kindergarten through sixth grade, and one in Council Bluffs, which is kindergarten through twelfth grade, that provide individualized instruction and integrated mental health and case management services for children living with mental illness who can't be served in their uh, regular schools. And we have a number of community-based programs that primarily deliver mental health services in the community. As examples, we have mental health crisis response programs in Sarpy, Cass, and Pottawatomie counties that work closely with law enforcement. When an officer encounters someone who appears to be homicidal, suicidal, or psychotic, they call our team and a licensed mental health counselor responds within 30 minutes to complete a differential assessment and then make a recommendation as to whether or not the client needs to be taken to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation, referred to as an emergency protective custody, or EPC. Approximately 94% of the time, we are able to avoid the EPC from happening, and we follow up to ensure the client has connected to the agency and community referrals we provide. We also operate an assertive community treatment program, an evidence-based model that delivers all of the integrated services that would be delivered in a hospital setting, but instead the clients, all of whom live with chronic and persistent mental illness, are in their own home in the community. This interdisciplinary team does rounds every day meeting to discuss each client and their progress, and they customize their approaches to meet the needs of the clients, such as delivering medications to some clients, helping some clients with grocery shopping, providing opportunities for socializing through an ancillary program called our Peer Center, providing physical fitness and nutrition coaching through another ancillary program called InShape, and in general, doing whatever is needed to ensure the clients are maintaining their independent living and physical, psychological well-being. Our housing and financial stability focus area encompasses our second largest constellation of programs, having grown rapidly over the last few years, primarily due to private investment in our strategies to prevent homelessness and to help individuals and families who are already homeless exit shelter as quickly as possible. This focus area also includes the work we do to help survivors of domestic abuse, sexual assault, and human trafficking, as a major component of this work is crisis stabilization in residential shelters and subsequent connections to housing. On any given day, we are helping approximately 1,500 individuals and families in our community maintain safe housing. As I previously mentioned, we operate two concealed shelters in our metro area. One of them, Safe Haven, is a crisis stabilization shelter for men, women, and children survivors of domestic abuse or sexual assault with capacity to serve up to 20 people at any given time. Services are comprehensive and include therapy, education, case management, and legal aid. Safe Haven is part of a continuum we offer of domestic abuse sexual assault services targeting primarily Sarpy and Cass counties. This continuum also includes advocates who go into the community to support survivors after law enforcement has removed the abuser, education classes for men and women who use violence, support groups, and we manage a 1-800 line 24-7-365 where survivors and law enforcement can request assistance. Sanctuary House, our other concealed shelter, is one of our newest programs and is a crisis stabilization shelter for men, women, and children survivors of human trafficking, as well as people wanting to leave commercial sex work. The program has capacity to serve 14 people at any given time. Similar to Safe Haven, services are comprehensive and include therapy, education, and case management. In addition, advocates work in the community to provide assistance to additional survivors outside of the people living in shelter. Just as we did when we first started in 1875, we continue to provide cash assistance to individuals and families in need. However, today those efforts are exclusively focused on helping our clients avoid homelessness. Thus, people with an eviction notice or a utility shutoff notice are our priority. In addition, we operate close to a dozen different programs to help individuals and families experiencing a housing crisis. Some of these programs are specifically for families. Some are for children aging out of foster care. Some are for people with relatively few barriers, and some are for people who have experienced chronic homelessness 
and have a disabling condition. In general, we can divide these programs into two major categories. First is rapid rehousing, which is for people with few barriers. In this program area, we help the clients find safe, affordable housing, pay the deposit and rent, provide case management, and fade away in 6 to 12 months once the clients are stable and able to return to living independently. The second category of programs is permanent supportive housing, which is for people who have experienced chronic homelessness and have a disabling condition. It's similar to rapid rehousing, except the clients can remain in the program as long as they'd like. Regardless of the program, we use a housing first model. If clients qualify to be in a program, we do not require they accept services or agree to any behavioral stipulations, for example, not drinking or taking drugs. Our first goal is housing. Once our clients are safe, we know, and research backs this assertion up, they will be in a much better position to access their emotional and thinking brains to develop a productive therapeutic relationship and then plan and make the progress that they, that they need on their goals. Our third and final focus area is child, family, and community well-being and includes programs that reach across the lifespan, primarily seeking to build upon assets and prevent problems and challenges from occurring. We provide in-home services to help children and families involved in the child welfare system or who are at risk of entering the child welfare system. Our staff meet with the families in their home or somewhere else in the community to supervise visits, provide coaching and education, case management, and in some cases therapy. We also offer a 12-week parenting program that includes information about child growth and development. This program is offered only in Spanish or Karen, the language of one of the largest ethnic groups comprising our refugee community from Burma. We offer a number of programs that work specifically to support the healthy development of children aged birth to five when brain development is so critical. One of our largest programs in this area is Ready in Five. Funded primarily by the United Way, Ready in Five provides kindergarten readiness education to refugee children ages three to five in the community. Typically, one family will volunteer to host the class and other families in the apartment building with young children will participate in these once a week classes that focus on the skills kindergarten teachers said were critical for success. Things like knowing your shapes and colors, knowing how to count to 10, knowing how to write your name. The program is always co-taught by the teacher and a cultural ambassador from the participating refugee community. Baby Talk is another community-based program that replicates a, a successful model created in Decatur, Illinois, where parents with new infants and young children are taught the ages and stages of child development, provided information about healthy attachment, and encouraged to participate in family literacy activities. Most of the work we do to address juvenile justice issues focuses on our refugee community. The Refugee Juvenile Advocate Program provides information and support to refugee families when a child enters the criminal justice system, typically after committing some sort of status offense. Our staff explain the diversion program and ensure the child and family understand why it is important to complete all of the assigned activities in order to avoid going further into the system. Of course, the staff who represent the refugee communities served by the program often do much more, providing information and referral and case management services to help these families address other needs that create barriers. Our flagship program is our Generation Center, located in North Omaha on the North Omaha Intergenerational Human Services Campus. This 10-acre location was developed by Heartland Family Service in collaboration with Holy Name Housing Corporation and includes 44 senior cottages for low-income seniors, the headquarters of Holy Name Housing Corporation, and our facility, which houses the One Oak School on the top floor and our Generation Center on the bottom floor. The Generation Center provides services to seniors in the neighborhood, including a healthy lunch and a variety of social activities designed to keep these seniors involved and less likely to become depressed and or experience a fall that would lead to long-term care. The primary goal is to help the clients age in place. The Generation Center also serves as the hub for the agency's Build Health Challenge Grant, a place-based initiative that is working with residents of the neighborhood to identify needs and solutions to improve the community's mental health. The activities undertaken evolve and are completely driven by the community members who volunteer to be a part of this initiative. The Generation Center is also the home of our Ruth K. Solomon Girls Center, an after-school summer school enrichment program that partners with small programs in North Omaha that exclusively serve girls. 
a Heartland Family Service therapist provides creative behavioral health interventions integrating into these partnering programs, things such as mindfulness activities and meditation. And supplemental enrichment activities and events are periodically provided for all of the girls and the parents at the Generation Center itself. Heartland Family Service started in 1875 and our mission really hasn't deviated much in all those years. There's a lot of families that do really well, but there are also families that struggle and children in those families that struggle and uh, they need help, they need resources. And no one entity probably can do it alone. And so we're there to participate in the, the solutions that really make a difference. And we've been doing that for a long time. My entire childhood was abusive situations after abusive situations. I started using drugs when I was 18 years old. I got myself clean, but I hadn't healed. And so I picked really bad paths to go on, bad relationships. I had fled a domestic violence situation that was not ending, he was stalking. It was just scary all the time and I couldn't take any more and I relapsed. And it wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't the path I wanted, but that was what I chose. No matter how hard this was for me to admit, I was a crap mom. I was lost in my own pain, my own addiction, and my focus was nowhere near what my children deserved. And so suicidal thoughts became an everyday thing because I truly, truly hated myself so much that I truly felt that the world would be a better place, that they would be better off if I wasn't in it. I actually went to the train tracks with my car. It was like a battle in my mind. It was, you know, I could maybe go somewhere with the girls and, and we could get help and I could get better and I could try. And there was the other part of me that, you know, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, this is where we always end up. And the part of me that wanted help and wanted better life for my girls won. Family Works was not just, let's focus on your addiction, you do drugs, you're a bad person. It was about why I was doing drugs. And Family Works gave me the time to heal myself through individualized therapy. Um, they offered parenting classes. And then at the same time, I had my kids with me. So I wasn't worried about what was going on with them. And now my girls are going through the therapy that they need to heal from things that they never should have gone through, but they did but they're getting a chance earlier in life to make better decisions and not repeat my pattern and be where I'm at at 30 years old. We're breaking the cycle now. Now I'm out in the world, okay? I've had this safe, beautiful bubble around me and it's gone. And now it's basically implementing everything I've learned, but in real world time. You know, what are the things that I'm coming across that might be triggering? How is my mental health doing? Scheduling all the things, my toolkit, my toolkit for sobriety. This November was our one year in our apartment and it's the most stable we've been. I think it felt like all the hard work had paid off and that we were gonna be okay and that we were gonna be making a lot of memories in our own home. If it was not for Heartland Family Service, the train tracks would have been a blessing. And instead, I had an amazing group of people involved in my life for the last two years who gave me the skills, the resources, and the support I needed to be healthy in sobriety in, in my thinking, in my parenting, and in the way I can handle things and take things on. We were given the stepping stones to start on the path of healing and to be able to have a healthy, productive, happy future. It's gonna be a good life. It's gonna be a good life. So what we know is that when life improves for one of us, life improves for all of us. We all matter.
So please give generously to Heartland Family Service and to our many, many programs that make a life-saving difference. Lynn's story provides an excellent example of how we are working to take the unvirtuous cycle we discussed earlier and turn it into a virtuous cycle. First, we address the trauma of our adult clients with our holistic, trauma-focused, and trauma-sensitive interventions, along with our continuum of services designed to address the complex array of needs our clients experience. And by doing that, we prevent the transfer of their trauma to the next generation. And we help that next generation to be the best they can be in order to build a community where everyone can thrive. Our annual operating budget is slightly more than $33 million. Our sources of revenue are fairly well balanced between grants and contracts, which are basically public funds that come from federal, state, and local sources, private fundraising, and fees for service, where we bill our clients' insurance, for example. Our largest area of expense, similar to any business in the service industry, is our people. Next, unique to our work, is the money we spend on helping our clients avoid homelessness. In terms of how our expenses flow by program focus area, the majority of our revenue is spent on counseling and prevention, followed by housing, safety, and financial stability, and then child, family, and community well-being. Our agency is governed by a 30-member volunteer board of directors representing diverse employers from large Fortune 500 companies to small local and national nonprofit organizations. Each board member can serve three three-year terms. Our officers, which include the board chair, vice chair, secretary, and treasurer, are elected for two-year terms. The current board chair is Megan Holtorf with FNBO. In addition to understanding our history, the people we serve, the programming we offer, and how our unique approach is making a lasting difference, it's also important to understand some of the major challenges we are facing as an organization. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a major challenge and one we were not initially prepared to address. However, we organized ourselves quickly around these four priorities. One, to keep our employee, employees and their families and friends safe. Two, to keep our clients and their families and friends safe. Three, to ensure the continuity of our business to keep the agency running so we can continue to serve the community. And four, to ensure the vital, oftentimes life-saving programs and services we offer remain available to the community during the outbreak. We have not laid any employees off and do not intend to. Outside of our residential programs and some of our administrative support roles, we were able to deploy staff to remote working environments using Zoom and DocuSign. We were fortunate to receive a Paycheck Protection Program loan from the Small Business Administration for just over $4 million, and we anticipate our application for loan forgiveness will be approved. In addition, we have likewise been fortunate to receive several private and public grants to support our COVID-19 relief efforts. These funds have been used to purchase personal protection equipment and needed distance technologies for staff, provide funding to programs that have been hit hard by funding cuts and declines in donations, and provide much needed resources to clients in order to avoid homelessness. We have also created a detailed return to workplace plan that identifies when and how we will return to our pre-COVID-19 operations. These plans are customized to meet the needs of each location and program and will likely evolve as we continue to learn more about this virus. That said, the first phase of our return to workplace plan will not be initiated until we've had 14 consecutive days of declining new COVID-19 cases, which is the recommendation of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We serve as the fiscal agency and coordinating entity for several prevention coalitions that focus on preventing the use and or abuse of alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. One of the major environmental strategies these coalitions use in their work is to educate locally elected officials. Currently, a major focus is on medical marijuana legislation and efforts to legalize recreational marijuana in Iowa and Nebraska. In general, there is growing support for the legalization of marijuana. However, our prevention staff are concerned because in most states, the marijuana industry has been creating the regulations for both medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. As a result, the amount of THC allowed in the marijuana, as one example, has not been controlled and accidental overdose deaths have occurred. In addition, 
research shows marijuana is a powerful gateway drug for young people. We have been fortunate to receive considerable private funding in recent years to augment the work we do to prevent homelessness and to help individuals and families find and keep safe housing. However, despite these resources, a major barrier often precludes our efforts to serve more people, a lack of safe, quality, affordable housing. As a result, affordable housing has become one of our priorities on our advocacy agenda. For our programs that are able to charge a fee for the services provided, those rates are seldom increased, and when increases do happen, they are minuscule and seldom keep pace with inflation. So in most cases, the fees we receive do not cover the cost of providing the services and must be augmented with private fundraising. This fact makes it difficult for our agency to provide substantive pay increases each year for our employees and to ensure our salary structure is competitive with other community-based nonprofits providing similar services. Our region has an extremely competitive labor market given we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. With our poor fee structure and reliance on private giving, it is difficult to pay salaries that are competitive to other related industries. For example, while we can pay a salary commensurate to what other community-based nonprofit organizations pay, we cannot compete with what a hospital will pay a therapist or what a school system will pay a social worker or counselor. Likewise, for for-profit managed care organizations can pay a case manager or a care coordinator considerably more than we can. Nevertheless, it's to these competitors and to private practice that we frequently lose talented staff. So we must do all we can to increase our salary structure. For that reason, we do salary benchmarking every two years, comparing our salaries to local, regional, and national benchmarks. And every year for the last two years, we've invested an additional 250000 in salary adjustments to slowly bring all of our positions to the 50th percentile on those benchmarks. Our goal is to eventually bring all of our positions to the 75th percentile, meaning we pay our, employee, our employees in the top quartile as compared to those benchmarks. Our agency has grown considerably over the last 12 years, from an annual operating budget of $16 million to an annual operating budget that is now more than double at $33 million. The number of programs we offer has likewise grown from 30 to 45, and the staff needed to run those programs and provide administrative support has grown from 270 to 410 full-time equivalent. To accommodate this growth, we've frequently had to lease space and to configure office space as tightly as possible in our existing space. At this point, however, we have no way to expand to continue to meet the demand for our services without a substantive change. So, we are in the process of implementing a space master plan that will result in the construction or renovation of six new buildings, the sale of two old buildings, and the end of six lease spaces. This effort will yield facilities that add value to our programming goals, accommodate our needs now and into the future, and create operating efficiencies that will reclaim approximately $500,000 annually. Funding that used to be spent on lease payments, maintenance, etc. for operations and now for services to our clients. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate your interest in Heartland Family Service and I invite you to reach out if you have any questions or would like additional information. I can be reached at area code 402-552-7402. You can also reach me via email at jjanetta at heartlandfamilyservice.org. A link to my email address is also accessible from our website. Go to heartlandfamilyservice.org, select the Our Team drop-down menu, and click on the leadership link. While you're on our website, you can learn more about our programs. You can also find client success stories, resources, and ways you can get involved to support our important work. We were started by this community and continue to need this community's active involvement if we are to achieve our vision for the future. Strong families, creating a strong community. Again, thank you.